Hi. In this video, we're going to be going through the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is one of the most important diagrams in astronomy. We're going to initially set up what the um, axes of the diagram are, what the different parts of the um, diagram can show us, and then we're actually going to use that diagram to help with thinking ahead to um, stellar evolution, even though we haven't fully introduced that topic yet. Uh, it's going to be something that we can then kind of refer back to the second half of this video for. So the very first thing that we want to make sure we understand for any kind of diagram is what the axes are. So any kind of graph has a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. So uh, for the vertical axis, we can measure um, a couple of different things. We can measure uh, absolute magnitude or luminosity. In both cases, what we're trying to describe is the absolute brightness. And we can do that with luminosity, which we're going to be kind of focusing on in this class or with absolute magnitude, which we'll see and astronomers use fairly often, absolute magnitude. In either case, at the top we have the brightest stars, no matter what kind of unit we're talking about, and on the bottom we have the dimmest stars. So we go from dim stars up to bright stars, no matter what we're trying to specifically plot. Then along the horizontal axis, what we have here is an axis that actually will count up to the left because for temperatures we're going to have hot stars on this side and cold stars on this side. And so temperature is actually counting up this way, so temperature is what we're trying to plot here. And the reason that um, it is backwards like this, the reason that hot is on the left and cold is on the right, small numbers up to big numbers, is because originally the way that this was set up was with spectral classes. So those spectral classes that we have seen in our slides already, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, those are the spectral classes or spectral types. And it was in that order when we initially built this um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. When Henry Norris Russell and Einar Hertzsprung built this diagram, they were using the spectral types in the order that they had been established. And that's why the temperatures kind of go backwards from what we're used to. But no big deal. The reason that this is such an important graph and an important diagram is not just because we plotted certain things on the axes, but it's because of the way in which stars appear on this diagram. They don't actually appear everywhere um, on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, so before I forget I'll call it the HR diagram. I'll put it at uh, a place where we can actually see that, probably will help. So HR diagram. And for the locations where stars show up, there's actually a limited number of um, spots where we have stars. So along the kind of center of the diagram, we get what's called the main sequence. So along this um, path called the main sequence, is where stars spend 90% of their lifetimes. So stars will sit on the main sequence at a certain temperature and luminosity for most of their lives. And that's just what they will, um, what they will do. And most stars then are found on the main sequence because time-wise that's where they um, are spending their lifetimes. However, we see other parts of this diagram filled with objects. And so over here we have red giants. Red because they are cold and giants because they are large. And above them we have supergiants. 
And then off in the bottom left corner, we have white dwarfs. White because they are hot, blue-white um, in color, and dwarfs because they are small, physically very, very small compared to other stars. Now, if this were the only thing um, that we could use this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for, we can still identify a couple of really key ideas. The fact that there's a whole swath of space that there are no stars that sit there. Stars cannot be stable at this uh, temperature and that luminosity. They would have to be a little bit brighter if they had that much um, temperature. But it doesn't just stop here. There's actually two other big ways that we can kind of use this diagram to, to think about things. The first is the way in which stars move through this diagram as they evolve. So forward in time, we can just figure out what the sun is going to do rather than just sit in one spot. And separately, we can add a couple more um, trends in the types of uh, characteristics of stars that we can actually read off of this diagram. So I'm going to start with the sun um, and how it evolves through this diagram. So the sun is a G star, so it's about here. So there's the sun. And it's going to spend 90% of its life on the main sequence, almost 10 billion years just sitting in that spot, nice and stable at a particular temperature, luminosity, and, wave, uh, and uh, radius. But once the star sun runs out of hydrogen in its core to be turning into helium. We'll talk about this more in the slides, but the main thing that's going to happen is that it will puff up its outer layers and become a red giant. So the sun will leave the main sequence and become a red giant, and that will be a short uh, stage of its lifetime. And then it will lose all of its outer layers, and what we'll end up with is the exposed core of the sun as a white dwarf. And that white dwarf, the core of the sun is already very, very hot. And when we lose those outer layers, we will see that extra hot, very, very dense core that's crunched down as much as it can to become this very small white dwarf that's about the size of the Earth. So this kind of process of stars moving around on the HR diagram is one that we will see in our slides in the future. Uh, and this is kind of a foreshadowing of that. But the last piece of uh, useful, uh, the last way that we can use this HR diagram in a useful way is by thinking about a couple of additional trends that we can use um, all of these different characteristics for. So we already can see that stars have certain temperatures. Red giants and supergiants tend to be colder than the main sequence stars that they used to be. White dwarfs are hotter. We can see trends in luminosity, so little tiny red dwarfs and really small white dwarfs are dim because to be very luminous you have to be either very hot or very big or both. And Bright stars either are on the main sequence and they're very big, bright blue stars, or they're incredibly large supergiants that are cold, but still bright because of their intense size. Now, we can actually add two other trends beyond just temperature and luminosity here. The first one is mass. From binary stars, we learned that there's a mass-luminosity relationship for main sequence stars which means along the main sequence, the highest mass stars are way up here, and the lowest mass stars are way down here. The reason that trend is only along the main sequence can be uh, kind of quickly noticed because the sun is going to leave the main sequence and bring all of its mass with it when it becomes a red giant. And so, the clear trend is just along here because stars are moving around all over the place after that point. So low mass all the way up through to high mass, but only along the main sequence. The other really key piece of um, information that we can get from an HR diagram that's a trend that we've actually talked about already, just not in this particular um, way, is radius or size of these stars. 
So if we drew a um, kind of horizontal line through the sun, then any star that falls along that line is going to have the same radius as the sun. It's going to have one solar radius. What that means is a lot of these main sequence stars, not all of them, but a lot of them have very similar uh, radius um, to each other. So stars that have a little bit more mass than the sun aren't remarkably larger in size, they're just a little bit crunched down from that extra mass. Now, if we continue this trend, if we drop down to about here, then any stars along that line would be about one-tenth the size, and any stars along this line would be about one-hundredth the size of the sun. Now, keep in mind, and those should all be kind of parallel to each other, keep in mind that we've talked about the fact that the sun is a hundred times bigger across than the earth is. And so this white dwarf that the sun will eventually leave behind, the fact that it's one one hundredth the size of the sun, means that that white dwarf is going to be about the size of earth, significantly more mass but crunched down to be very, very high densities and be about the same physical size in radius. In the other direction, what that means is uh, red giants can be uh, 10 times the size of the sun or up to 100 times the size of the sun. And super giants can get even kind of bigger uh, beyond that, so 1,000 or um, slightly more times the physical size of the sun. But these extreme um, sizes tend not to be stars on the main sequence. Along the main sequence, you can get up to um, stars that have uh, like 20 times the mass of, or 20 times the radius of the sun, uh, but not significantly more than that. When we see these really, really large um, stars in comparison to the sun in images or in video, we're seeing giants and supergiants, stars that have left the main sequence. And so I know that this um, diagram now looks fairly chaotic, right? We added a lot to it, um, but you can go back and rewind and kind of watch it happen piece by piece um, through the video. And if you haven't drawn this in your notes yet, it may be a good idea to, to try to um, pause this video and kind of uh, minimize the browser and try to draw what you can from memory to see what's kind of stuck and what makes sense as we um, talk through red giants and white dwarfs. And then go back to the start of this video and kind of as we build the pieces, the axes and then the main locations where we found stars and then the way that the sun moved and then the additional trends, every time we add a piece, kind of make sure that you've drawn it in that correct way. Uh, and it will help make it so that it doesn't look like all of a mess all at once, right? This kind of thing would not be what I introduce us with. That's why we have the deeper look video to begin with, is so that we don't end up with too much on one slide that we can't really see where it came from. So again, the HR diagram is one of the most important diagrams in all of astronomy, and it's because it has all of this information in it. And so if you get to a point in the semester where you really just need a refresh on what the HR diagram is and what we have um, as information in it, then just rewatch this video and that's why, um, that's why we can record it. So um, thanks very much and I will see you in the next video.